subject then. Um, big subject, try to compress it into simple manageable chunks and I'm going to give you three takeaways when you leave it. Um, at the back of the room you can take a fair model with you which will explain what that is and how you can use that, you can take that in hard copy. There's a leadership paper on, um, on just culture development and then there's a self-assessment that you can take with you to score yourself against just culture. If we had a bit longer like two hours we could have done it here and got your results and seen where you thought you were. But I'm going to let you take that away and take it back to your businesses. So don't leave without taking one with you. That, they'll be on the back, um, Scott's at the back, and we'll be handing those out. So we're going to go on a journey of four things. Why just culture? What is it? How to build one? Does it deliver? And, and what about this cross-cultural stuff, this international stuff? Does it work everywhere? Uh, and let me tell you now, the answer to the last one is no. So, should we go to the bar? <laughs> no, it doesn't. You have to do some other things. Uh, it definitely works in an Anglo-Saxon culture. If you're not in one of those, then it needs a bit, of, a, a bit of thinking about and a bit of subtle work. We'll talk about that as we go. Ask me questions at any time, please. Okay? I don't want to be the only one talking here, but if you prefer, then that's what we'll do. So, why? Why would you want a just culture? What does it mean? We'll come back to in a minute. But a proactive safety culture, one where we can know what's coming at us rather than what's just hurt us, is vital for the management of safety risk. It is the key ingredient of safety culture. And if you've been in the previous session, we've just been talking about where that needs to start at the top of the business and how to get that to start from the top of the business. But you won't get a proactive safety culture if you aren't just. Just is short for justice. It's short for being fair, for being repeatable, for being trans translucent, for, uh, for transparent, that's the word I meant. Um, we're, we're trying to get something that people understand how, how I'm going to be treated. What's the difference between acceptable and unacceptable behavioural choices? That's what we're talking about here. And without an understanding of that, you won't get one of those. Um, being just is definitely the bedrock of safety performance. We're seeing leading aviation organisations who have got massive reporting cultures um, that, that are nudging the seven, eight reports per person per year type cultures that are coming as a result of opening up the culture within the organisation. So that's what we're going to describe here in a little bit more depth. Uh, a just culture is, is what will open up. When we ask people, will you tell me, why don't people report? Obviously, there's one of fear, isn't there? What's, what's going to happen? Will I lose my job? Will it count against me in the future? Are there other reasons why they don't report? Personal Hazards. Pride. Pardon? Personal pride. Pride. Yeah, bad things happen to bad people. Sort of statements we use. Shame. Yeah, shame. I'm ashamed that it happened to me. When I was a young aircraft engineer, I left the thrust reverse locked out on an A320. Uh, I, I felt shame. I felt shame. The aircraft went flying with no thrust reverse functioning. And it was, it was shame. I felt awful for, for months, if not years. In fact, I haven't got over it. Shall I share it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. So shame, pride, fear. Any other reasons? Nothing, Nothing happens. Anything else? It's too difficult. It takes too much time. I can't be bothered type stuff. Too difficult. I went to an airline, we went to an airline. Whenever I say I, I mean Bain Simmons. Um, 
I had eight different ways of reporting things, depending whether it was a ground incident, whether it was a flight side incident, whether it was whether it was equipment or whether it was health and safety or, or, or PPE, all these different methods. You just want to report, so make it easy, give them an app. Tell me what the problem is. And when you press send, it puts all your details in it. That's how to get a reporting culture. But without this settled sense of justice in the business, you won't get there, definitely. Above all else, a just culture will let you find out what people have to do to get the job done. And when you find out what they have to do to get the job done, it will shock you. And I'll give you some examples, some photographic examples of that through this presentation. Um, it facilitates risk-based decision making. If you don't know what the hazards are, how on earth can you manage them? And if your people don't tell you what the hazards are, how are you going to find them? You get all the occurrences, they're back in the wake of your vessel over here. If you've been in the last session, we've already built all of that picture. But this is the doing of risk-based decision making. So, we used to blame and train people. When I left the thrust reverse, locked out on an A320 working for a large blue and silver airline in Britain, um, I was punished. I was sent home for three days without pay. I had a letter put on my file telling me I was a bad lad. At the end of the year though, my boss who'd sent me home for three days without pay and put the letter on my file, at the end of the year gave me a Christmas bonus to make up for it. And he put his arm around me and said, thanks for taking one for the team, Kev. What sort of culture is that? Is that what it's like in your business? Do you know what sort of culture you have? <coughs> Are you just? Or do you think you're just? You'll be able to score yourself on the self-assessment. But that's where we've come from as an industry. And some organisations, like back in the day, Northwest Airlines in, 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 um, in the US, went for the no blame. And they said, as long as you're involved in something bad, as long as you put your hand up afterwards, there's a no jeopardy reporting process here. Uh, what do you think of that? Is that good? What if someone's spinning a tug round, an aircraft tug, to show off to all their friends, out on the ice, in front of the, on, in front of the aircraft, on the ramp, they go, hey, look at this, handbrake turns, look at me, and they kiss an aeroplane, and then they put their hand up and go, sorry boss, I didn't mean that to happen. That's a no blame fault, and you've got to let them off. You don't want that, because their choice there was conscious risk taking, wasn't it? It's over here. And, and it's knowingly, and without, justifica without justification, increasing risk. That's a behaviour we don't want, so no blame doesn't work. If I go out into your, into your maintenance facility and I find a hacksaw and I cut through the biggest wiring loom on the flying machine in your hangar, and I say, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, that's, that's a no blame culture. You want to deal with that, that's a criminal act. So somewhere we've got to draw a line in the sand. You're happy with the term line in the sand? It's just a euphemism for a line between unacceptable and acceptable behaviour. And you need to draw the line. Not me, not some other consultant, not some regulator, you do. You need to decide where you think that line in the sand is. That's the basis of a just culture. So, in this, in this model here, which is our smart map of the, safe, of the management systems and the enablers, we've just clicked on proactive culture here, and we think it's made up of just culture, reporting culture, flexible culture, questioning culture, and learning culture. You won't get one of those if you haven't got one of those. They're interrelated, but not necessarily automatically flow from one another, but they're definitely interrelated. And the essence of a learning culture is one where new people aren't making old mistakes. Isn't it? How many times does something like that happen to you and you go, oh, I thought we'd sorted that one out years ago. Doesn't that happen still? So a learning culture is where we feed that forward and we change and we have system improvements. So the bedrock of this proactive safety culture is founded upon a just culture in which individuals freely and openly share safety-related information in an atmosphere of trust born from a sense of justice. And that's where the word just comes from. It's holding the scales out of justice. You don't have to take photographs, you'll get copies of this. And you can go on my website and download it if you want, bainsimmons.com. All this is on there and you can take it. Um, but I will give you a copy, a version of this, but it's got some scary pictures in which you won't get. Um, so, just culture. What's the benefits? Confidence that people will be treated fairly, and they'll feel they're able to change something in the operation. Um, then they'll report. Then you'll get information, and information should start to set you free. This is the why information, why people are making the choices they are, what's happening to them. 
Um, then you'll be able to determine how risky that is for you, and then you'll have improved risk-based decision-making, which is the essence of safety management, isn't it? That's why we're doing it. So you could say you can't have safety management without a just culture, if you believe that. And I would say that's the case. I can prove it's the case, actually. And there's a difference, as we've just agreed in the previous session, but I'll share for those who weren't there. There's a big difference between the safety management system and the management of safety. That's a tree, the other's a tree with fruit on it. It's the fruit that we're growing the tree for, the ability to make risk-based decisions. This is a rubbish analogy, but maybe the compost is the just culture. <laughs> I've just made that up, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Scott's shaking his head. Um, don't tell him I said that back at the company. Um, it's also, we're talking about the benefits of a just culture, it's increasingly becoming something that's required in regulation. So in Europe, we've got a new regulation, this one here, uh, 367 20, 2104, uh, from November of this year, each organisation established in a member state shall, means will in law, adopt internal rules <coughs> describing how just culture principles are guaranteed and implemented. So you will have one, including all regulatory organisations, not just those who are regulated. And this is across all domains, air traffic, ground ops, flight ops, maintenance, airworthiness, initial airworthiness. Um, definition then, one of many, but one that works, I believe. A culture that recognises that even competent individuals, this is not knowledgeable individuals, Competent. Knowledge, skills and attitudes make up competence typically. Will make errors and acknowledges that even competent professionals will develop unhealthy norms. Hand up if you drive a car, please, bear with me. Come on, hands up high. Only put your hands down if you never break the rules. Ah, oh, a room full of violators. <laughs> Two hands goes up. <laughs> so you're rule breakers. All humans are looking for utilities, faster, smarter, quicker. That's what we mean by unhealthy norms. If I give you $100 to go and buy a DVD player down the road and you go home to plug it in and make it work, how will you make it work? Hands up if you'll read the, the instructions before you plug it in. Come on, there's one. Thank you, sir. <laughs> there's more than one in here, you're being shy. But mostly we just make it work, we make a risk-based decision. What can go wrong? So, in, in the world of aviation, people are making the same risk-based decisions without the full data set. That's what we're trying to get to. We're trying to learn about that stuff. What are those unhealthy norms? Shortcuts, routine rule violations. The word violation is a very strong word. It means rule breaking, yes? And you just said you were all rule breakers. Sometimes, because you have to, it's easier to. Uh, everyone else does, there's, there's no deterrent. Uh, it's safe to, you know best, you're an expert. They're all reasons for violating. And that's what we're trying to understand in our aviation systems. Because when we understand them, we can manage them. And they're the things that take us to the edge of risk, to the edge of pain. Yes? So, the problem with us humans is we've all got an error zone. On the best day, we might be about 80. The, the statistics vary, but, you know, Oh, we know that humans make errors about one in a thousand op operations in routine work. One in a thousand, guaranteed. Doesn't mean badness will occur, doesn't mean it won't be tracked, but you will make errors. Errara humana est, as Marcus Tillis Cicero said in 103 BC. To err is human. Nothing's changed. The Mark I human is still the Mark I human. We make errors. What we're interested in is with these performance instruments influencing factors like time of day and all the other human factors that we know, stress, pressure, lack of, too much of, um, it drives our performance down to the right hand side. What does this also represent for you up here? What does it represent in your safety management efforts? As a person's performance drops off, what increases? Risk. Thank you. And we're here to manage risk. That's what a safety management system is built for. It's a management system to give us the ability to make risk-based decisions. So we want to know, on a normal operation, 
What could go wrong in here? What does it look like? It's part of the human condition. So, when we talk about error though, there are different types of error. There's a slip, a lapse, and a mistake. It didn't quite do what I wanted to do. I forgot or wasn't concentrating, that's a lapse. Because I made the wrong decision, that's a mistake. Now these are technical terms that if we're gonna manage this stuff in our businesses, you have to become familiar with. You have to manage in your just culture process. If you try and intervene here by telling people to be more careful, it won't work. And yet the, the thing I see the most in safety management systems across the world is loads of reports, great investigations, and then we do two things. Remind them of their responsibilities and tell them to be more careful. Three, and then write a new procedure. Don't we? Still? We need to know why, what, what are the behaviours, where did they come from before we intervene. The essence of a just culture is to give you the ability to find out why people do what they do so that we can fix the system to reduce the likelihood of reoccurrence. You'll notice I never say to prevent, because someone comes looking for me when I say that and it's gone home again, because it can still go wrong for different motives. When it comes to rule breaking, there was no other choice. That's a situational violation. Because the situation was never imagined, that's exceptional. Because it's what we do around here. It's what we have to do around here. And that's rule breaking for organizational gain. But it really comes down to three things. Won't, don't, can't. That's why most people break the rules. If you can find a fourth one, there's definitely a, a thesis you could write on that. You could make some money out of it. Can't, don't, won't. I can't follow the rules. We don't follow the rules. I won't follow the rules. Which one of those do you want to get rid of? Which one of those worries you the most? Pardon? Won't. Won't is over this side of the line. Can't is over this side of the line. You're going to intervene where they can't differently from when they won't. Does that make sense? When they won't, who have you got a problem with? Me. When they can't, what have you got a problem with? <laughs> yeah, my boss, who made me do this this way in a system that's imperfect. Or the system. Okay. So what we're getting here is the beginnings of a just culture model. You have to understand and apply. This is the application of human practice. So, error or violation. Sorry, I'm in your way. I'm terrible for this. Where do I stand? Hands up if you think it's an error. Hands up if you think it's a violation. Hands up if you don't know. Does it matter? Why does it matter? Because you have to figure out why it happened. Yeah, so that. So you can attempt to prevent it happening. Yeah, trouble with this one is what? You probably don't know, but it happens a lot. Now this one is an A319, this one's a 320, 319, same engines, both, both sets of cowlings came off, it was on fire over London. You don't want that, do you? You really don't. The British Airways aeroplane, both cowlings were left unlatched. But the problem with it is it's happened 39 other times that we know about in our industry. What are you interested to get the answer to? Why? Anything else? Okay. What is happening? Why it happened? How to stop it? So there's another question there. They're great questions to ask is, how many times does it nearly happen and no one told us? Does that matter? Why? It gives you the full range of what's happening. Yes. One of my clients took off on a taxiway, or their, their people did, in Schiphol with a 737 full of passengers took off on a taxiway and skip off. And they wanted to punish the pilots. Do you want to punish the pilots? Is it dangerous? Is it high risk? What they just did. It's definitely not medium risk, is it? It's the potential for real badness to occur. Um, I said to them, what I'm really interested in is how many people nearly took off on that taxiway and didn't, and didn't tell you, and what your culture is like so that they can 
that's much more powerful. I can manage hazards. I can't manage my currents. It's happened. I can't stop it happening. It's done. But if you tell me that you need, it must be really enticing, that taxiway, mustn't it, for someone to take off on it? It must be really, it must be the lighting or the markings or the, or, or the location or the orientation. There's something about that situation I want to know. But what I also want to know is, did they do it in error or did they do it intentionally? What do you think? Do you think they did it intentionally? If they did it intentionally over this side of the line, they're going to go to court. That's a criminal act. I bet they didn't. I want to know why. And I want to know why the airline didn't know. Because when they did ask some of the pilots, actually they didn't, we did. We said, you know, uh, uh, did it happen to you? No, no, I couldn't possibly say. Really? Well, all right, yeah. It's, I'll tell you why it can happen. It's because of where it is and how, where you think you are. And where the markers are for the runway, the lighting in the area is not good. And it's very enticing. So they're all things you could have managed if you knew. But we don't know. Now, if you go into an Airbus hangar and it's undergoing routine maintenance, the last task card you will see in the work lectern is the closing of the cowlick. Not because it's the last job to do. It's because it's so error provocative. Anyone who's ever worked the Airbus knows, don't touch those cowlicks because they look closed when they're not. So it's a hazard. And we're not hearing about it because they don't know that we want to hear about it. And so we're not able to manage it until it goes wrong and nearly kills everybody on board. How does an Airbus full of people over London on fire? And they couldn't put the fire out because there's no cowling to hold the extinguisher. So, error or violation? I don't know. What I know is that this aircraft is going on deployment. It's a military helicopter. And that's all the cars for the, for the people who are waving their families goodbye as it's going on deployment. And it made them move the helicopter over and hit on the side of the hangar. And they all went, oh, we've had this before. Oh, we've nearly done that ten times. It's a bit late to tell me now. But they didn't have a just and open culture. So, most people then say to me, but we've got one of those. Hands up if you've got one in your business. A just culture. Go on, hands up high, please show me. Most of you then. Let's go to the bar. <laughs> Seriously. So, there's a self-assessment at the back of the room. I want you to fill that in and collar me tonight in the bar or tomorrow and give me your score. I won't share it with anybody. I can tell you, though, across industry, most organisations who've had one for years score about 43% on average. Can you pass these tests? Can you find it? Can you explain it? Do you follow it? Or do you role model it? Defined, understood, applied and demonstrated. There's a model you can go back and you can test your organisation against. If you're really successful, if you really have one, you will be getting reports at the scale you. And I suspect there's work to do, otherwise you wouldn't want to be in here. So, there's a test there. Average score, 43%. So, can we measure just culture? Yes, we can. You've already seen this if you've been in the room next door. You can measure it against a performance model. You can measure it, and there's two different measurements. This is one organisation and this is another. This one is the measurement system for a just culture. So, yes, you can measure it. So, we've talked about why you have it, so that you can find out what people have to do to get the job done. We've talked about what it is. Now we need to talk about how to build one. Because we've just shown that it can be measured. So if it can be measured, you must be able to build it. There's a number of phases to the building of a just culture. We start with, where are you now? You need to go back and say, where are we? Some kind of assessment against your safety culture. Your just part of your safety culture. What do you need to put in place? A safety vision, policies, procedures, investigation process, and above all else, some kind of just culture toolkit. Hands up if you've got a just culture toolkit in your business. So you haven't got a just culture, I'm afraid. <laughs> ah, good question. What's the toolkit? That's my jewel in the crown. <laughs> I'll tell you in a minute. Um, how do we energise our staff? Competence development, coaching, promotion, promoting that we have a just culture and measuring that you apply a just culture. The problem is, when you have punished somebody who's over this side of the line, it's very hard to tell everyone that, isn't it? You can't tell everyone, yeah, we punished that person because they broke the rules. 
What you can do is independently assure that you have a just culture, and you can measure that where the assurance part of your business comes and look at the safety management part of your business and said, how many times have we used the Just Culture Toolkit? How did you use it? Did you follow process? And where did you find people? So organisations who do this, where did you find people in terms of the line in the sand? Organisations who do this are, are like the Qantases of the world who have been doing this a long while and, um, uh, and some other uh, leading organisations. Military aviation getting quite good at this in the UK certainly. Um, they, they, they reckon about, about 95, 96% of the people are this side of the line. Only about 4 or 5% are over here in the obvious. And I'll show you where the line is in a minute. And that's promotion. And then it's re-education. And that's continual re-energising of it. You can't just put it in a procedure and hope you'll have it from then on. Because you won't. <coughs> Sustain it by assurance, which I've just talked about, and measurement, which I've just given you an example of. So, hands up if you measure whether you've got a safety culture routinely. So you haven't got a just culture. Some kind of balanced scorecard, some kind of safety diagnostic to say, well, if we were there then, now we've got it, where are we today? This is essential. You have to measure it, otherwise people don't know if you do actually have it. So, we'll have some kind of just culture vision. Then we'll be able to measure it. Because like any journey, we've got to know what it's going to look like when it's performing. So let's look at a just culture vision. This is not safety culture. This is the just element within it. We'll have opened up the culture through a high degree of trust between staff and all levels of management. Everyone will be able to describe our just culture and it will positively, positively shape the decision making. We'll become increasingly, 20% year on year, less occurrence and more hazard focused. This is being just. This is how it works. Increasingly third age, so that we know what our people have to do to get the job done. Third age being me and us reports. First, second age being them. First age being things. We'll talk about more of that, and some of you have already heard that today. We'll have a culture where unjustifiable risk-taking, or risk-taking behaviour, will not be tolerated at any level. you are starting to draw the line now in the sand. Everyone will be able to say stop when they find themselves getting close to that line and we will be listened to and supported by us. With no exception, irrespective of outcome severity, no matter how bad it is, our just culture process will be applied. So, you're all aviation people in here, I'm guessing. I'm going to put oil in your flying machine. You've got engines on your flying machine. There's no, there's no glider operators in here, is there? Before I go down this little road, this cul-de-sac. Um, I'm going to put oil in. You ask me to put oil in your, it's what you pay me to do. So I open the panel, I take the cap off, I'm just putting oil in the engine, and you come and interrupt me. And I, I talk to you and I go, yeah, I'll be with you in a minute, thanks so much, and I forget to put the cap on, because you've just distracted me, and I include that distraction in this behaviour, of this job. I close the panel and I walk away. I'm just signing up in the tech log, and I think, did I put that panel on? Did I put that cap on? I can't remember it. Ever done this? Guarantee you have. You get to work in the morning, you think, I don't remember driving to work. <laughs> Did I go through those traffic lights? <laughs> I must have done. Arara humanum est. Yes? To air is human. It's normal. I go back out, I'm looking over my shoulder, and I go, why am I looking over my shoulder as I open the panel? So no one sees me. Because? Because I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed that I've made a mistake. You haven't given me permission to be human. It's your fault. I will make errors. I put the cap on quickly and close the panel and I go, <laughs> that was lucky. What have we just lost? A report. Information. The ability to learn. You've lost a hazard report. And I don't want to tell you because I think you'll think I'm stupid. I think it might count against me in the future if I've made five errors and I've told you. Now the next day, so nothing's happened, there's no outcome. Aircraft goes flying, everything's fine. The next day, I come and do the same thing, open the panel, take the cap off, and you interrupt me this time, sir. And I include what you've said in my, and I do the same thing again. And when I'm about to sign up, you interrupt me again. Now I'm not thinking what I'm doing, and I sign up. I go home, the helicopter flies, the flying machine flies, the oil comes out, it's an in-flight shutdown, there's an air turn back, there's a diversion, we 
land in a place that we're not used to landing in, we damage the helicopter. What do you want to do with me? What's happened in both events? What's the same in both events? Distraction. What type of behavior have I, have I been... It's, what, what, what behavior have you seen from me? Try to do the right thing? So what do we call my, my, my actions? It's, a, it's an error. It's an unintentional act, unintentionally committed. Did I try and do the right thing? Yeah. What's the difference between the two events? The outcome. That's what that last bit means. With no exception, irrespective of outcome severity, our just culture process will always be applied. That's hard. Badness has just occurred. I've damaged one of our flying machines that's now not available to us. It's very enticing to blame people now, isn't it? Blame is a delicious emotion, isn't it? I do it to my wife at home when she's left something out of the fridge. I go, oh, I can't believe you've done it. She went, that's very just culture of you, isn't it? <laughs> so, what we used to do, and what I'm advocating we don't do now, is this. We have threats or contributing factors. We have hazards or performance influencing factors. They lead to unsafe acts, errors, mistakes, violations. They get through our defences and we have an unwanted event. You're all familiar with that model. That's old as the hills. Then what do we do? It's reactive and we have an occurrence report back here. We investigate it and we intervene. And we normally write a new procedure, tell them to be careful or tell them off or punish them. So what's missing is this stuff. We want the proactive reports over here because they trust us. We want near misses. My near miss is me telling you I nearly left that oil cap off. That's a near miss, yes? That's valuable to you. It's, it's, it's where we, I will tell you when I violate. I'll say, listen, to get the job done, I have to do this. And you'll go, why would you do that? But you'll listen to me and together we'll fix it. And I'll show you some of those pictures in a minute. We still do an investigation, but we have a just culture toolkit. This is what, where we are now. This is the answer to your question. And we have some kind of event review group between that and that. Before we intervene, we put just culture process in place. From that, we have feedback and promotion to continue to develop our learning safety culture. And we have data exploitation, so that you can answer the question, what are the three human in the system risks? Who owns them around here? What are they doing about them? How much money are they costing? What do you mean you don't know? That's what we're talking about there. If this works, the performance of error management in a, in a safety management system is being able to answer that question. What are the three human in the system risks? By department, by aircraft type, by operational type, by type of person? What are my top three human in the system risks? How are we learning about them? What are we doing about them? Who owns them? How much money are we spending on them? That's the answers we're trying to get. That's why we have a just culture. Without a just culture, you will not be able to answer those questions. So, can anyone answer that question in their business in this room? What are the top three human in the system risks? Anybody? Do you want to be able to? Your Mark 1 human will take you to the edge of badness before any machine will. <coughs> Machines don't go wrong anymore. That's not true. They don't go wrong as much as humans take us to the edge of badness. We know that. So, we need a just culture toolkit. I'm going to give you one free at the back of the room. I'm not here to sell you something. The reason we created this just culture toolkit was because so many people were making their own up and it was getting them into bad places. A lot of people were downloading from Jim Reason's book the, the algorithm that he gave. And, and it's just literally a, a, a description of how, how a just culture could operate when James Reason wrote that book back in the early 90s. In fact, in Qantas, it was known as five ways to get yourself fired. It doesn't work. It isn't an algorithm. So we wanted to create one. And this is a just culture tech, uh, toolkit. We call it FAIR, uh, the flowchart analysis of investigation results. Because you can't make a just culture decision if you don't know why it happened. If you think about those cowlings left open, we need to know why before we can answer whether it's an error or a violation, don't we? <coughs> so, <coughs> we're just checking time here. What we 
we're trying to do is a behaviour-based system for creating, that's what FAIR is, for creating and sustaining a just culture. To enable you to intervene around the human in the system. Treating all in a fair and importantly consistent manner. That's what it's about. It's a straightforward thing to use, but it isn't absolute. It doesn't tell you what to do. It takes you to places where you can make management decisions. It helps you identify effective interventions. And we haven't got time to cover that in great depth today, but we'll talk about it. And ensure personal accountability. So before I go any further, are you happy with the word blameworthy? Well, blame. Let's start with the word blame. Are you happy with the word blame? What that means? Accountability? Blameworthiness? What does that, what does that all mean? What does it mean to you? It's kind of like passing the buck, maybe. But look, if I... If I, if I um, God forbid, but uh, knock on wood as I say this, but if I'm driving at 50 miles an hour past a school, uh, but in my country there's a 20 mile an hour speed limit past the school, I still think that's too high, but if I was doing 50 miles an hour past it, and I ran over a child who ran out of the school gates, what do you want to do with me? You want to pat me on the back and go, oh, there, there, there. It's a shame it happened to you. What do you want to do with me? You want to punish me. You're happy with the word punishment then? got there in the end, didn't we? <laughs> you want to punish me? Why do you want to punish me? I made a choice that was wrong. It was inappropriate given the conditions. So why in, why in our society do you want to punish me? Because of the outcome, yes? To, to make an example of me so that what? So that other people won't do it. And also, there's some kind of, there's some other thing there, isn't there? You know, what's the other thing? There's, there's more. Law. Retribution. There's retribution. Yeah. If it's my kid they've run over, I, I want the person dealt with. Don't you have emotion as well? Because that would be probably publicly reported, and then you'd have half the nation wanting to string you up as well. Yeah. Oh, the media will be all over that in our country, in, in, in the UK. The red top newspapers love that stuff point to someone, that's blame. We're blaming them, we're giving them, we're, 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 we're making a judgment over the behaviour that they made. But, but actually, why, why do we have these legal systems? Oh, it's a big debate. They want to get into philosophy of that. But it's, it's largely to create what? Fair and just society. Where, where bad choices are dealt with and, and so that People don't normally, don't normally do that. It is, it, it, we, we, we eradicate that set of behaviour. Uh, and, uh, and in some countries we put people in prison for it. But between the act of me running a child over and me being blamed and the degree of blame being given to me or a degree of punishment, what was your word, sir? I've forgotten it. Retribution, punishment, wasn't it? It was punishment. So the degree of punishment you give me from a telling off to a putting in prison for 10 years, is determined by who in your country? Who makes that decision? The judiciary, the legal system that you have in your country. And there's some kind of hearing, there's an investigation, and then there's a decision. And that's what we're trying to do here. That's what personal accountability means. But it's balanced with our desire for learning and improvement. If you just punish every time someone leaves a thrust reverse locked out, Guess what happens? Nothing. Because I'm not going to tell you about it, because I might get punished, even if it nearly happened to me. Now what was interesting about my event, as I'm just self-counselling here with you, um, I, got, I, I got a job in safety subsequently, because I really wanted to change the world after my experience. I found out that it happened to 14 other people. 14 other people I pulled the pin out, moved the lever across, put the pin in, and as we took our hands out, the spring-loaded panel closed, and there was no indication that that was in a safe position. Nothing on the flight deck, nothing on the aircraft. I wasn't required to put the flag on it to say remove before flight. I was required to go to the, to, to the tech lock and write down that I put it in safe mode. 
But between doing it and doing that, a load of other stuff happened and I forgot. You want to blame me? Because I was blamed. I don't know. No one investigated it. So I was punished without an investigation. Is that fair? Do you do this? You don't. You've got the beginnings of a just culture then, if you don't do that. It's like going to the doctor and them telling you what's wrong with you before they've investigated, before they've had a look at you. You wouldn't do it, would you? Oh, you know what's wrong with you is you've got a bad back. Well, actually, I came in because I broke my finger. You've got to find out what the problem is before you know how to solve it. It's about focusing on the actions and intentions rather than the consequences. If we just deal with the consequences, like the two engine oil problems we have here, we punish people for bad things, and we never learn. We don't get system improvement. And we need cross-cultural commonality as far as possible. Now, what I suggest to you here, if you take the FAIR tool and have a look at it and decide whether you want to use it, is some of the language in it would need to be adjusted for your culture. Some of the language. And I'll show you why in a moment. So, this is how it works. And I, really, I bet you wish you sat at the front now. <laughs> um, like the judiciary in your country, we separate the investigations from the judgment. So you've got non-judgmental decision and judgment. So the input is a hazard, a near-miss, or an occurrence report over here. And the next thing we do is precautionary action. We contain the problem. And that is probably includes, which is why you need to include your unions or workers' councils in this process when you launch it. It probably includes sending someone home on full pay while you investigate. Why would you do that? Why would you send them home while you investigate? Why don't you let them carry on working? You don't know, you don't want them happening again, you don't want them re-offending, did you say? Yeah, you don't want them, they probably are questioning their own judgment as well at this time. They're probably feeling pretty bad about what's happened, depending on the outcome. So, immediate precautionary action and containment. <coughs> Then you carry out a structured human in the system investigation using trained investigators. If you haven't got trained investigators and you use a structured investigation tool that goes into a common database with a common taxonomy, like HVACs or something like that, if you haven't got that, you won't succeed in building a just culture, I would suggest. Uh, for reasons will become apparent. So, non-judgmental, we're just finding out why investigators. Then we form an event review group that has a number of people in. This should be an odd number because they've got to make a judgment. An even number group makes it more difficult to come to a judgment. They will look at the investigation report and ensure that all of the why questions have been answered. The why did it happen? Ask five whys, get to the bottom of it. They might take further action using the FAIR tool, which I'll show you in a moment. They might take further information. Has the person got a previous history of a lot of stuff like this? And that's a difficult one. Have they got previous, they say, the police in my country? Have they got a previous record? Ah, that's a tough one. You have to be careful with that. If someone's been involved with three previous errors, it might mean what? Personal issues, intentional non-compliance, training, they might not be competent, drug and alcohol, it could be all sorts of things. Their character, are they, are they even capable of doing the job? I don't know. So we have to take that into account though. It could be that they're your best person. Who do you give the job to when there's an AOG? Come on. The best person. What does that mean? They're busy. So, <laughs> you, you want a job done, give it to a busy person. They're possibly so busy, they make more errors. If you've got an unmet need, it's normally time, equipment, spares, parts, competence, knowledge, facilities, or whatever else, you give the job to your best person. So they might just be exposed to more badness. Don't know. 
Identification of effective, sustainable interventions from a human and a system perspective. That's the job of the event review group following some golden rules. Only then is a decision made on blameworthiness or how much punishment they should be given or how accountable they are for their actions. I'll show you in a moment how that works. And only then is it given over, typically to an administrative department, human resources, personnel, or whoever else, to administer that punishment. And this is the 3 to 5% over here. Most people do not require or is of limited value to punish somebody when they didn't intend to do it. Now, I haven't got time to teach you this stuff in great depth. But the event review group, these people in the middle, is vital. If you think you've got a just culture process, actually you haven't if it isn't being decided by an, in, an independent group of people. Have we found the contributing factors? Have we identified the root cause of the event? Are we intervening correctly? Is there a case to answer in terms of punishment? They're the four key questions that the event review group asks in the middle here. Root cause, contributing factors, have all the whys been answered? To ensure effective interventions are put in place following the event. That's the primary reason you need a just culture to reduce the likelihood of reoccurrence to as low as reasonably practical in your safety risk management system. Make sense? This sounds really, excuse me, it sounds really complex, this, and I don't want to overcomplicate it because it isn't. It's a simple process. We have an event or a report that contain the action, we do an investigation, we make a decision, we intervene, and potentially we make a decision as to whether somebody is on the left or the right of the line in the sand. The place that most aviation organisations draw the line in the sand is along the line of recklessness. So let's show you where that is. The event review group, SMS manager, event review group members who are trained, un an e uneven number if possible, and subject act uh, matter experts. You might have to bring a pilot in, you might have to bring a ground ops person in, a fuel expert or whatever else to give you some judgement. To minimise uh, bias and preserve impartiality, you do not bring the manager of the department in question into that group. Big discussion, but that's been long learned by the 1,500 users that we know are using the fair tool today. 1,500 aviation organisations. So this is it. This is how you make a decision on, on blameworthiness or where someone is in terms of their behaviours. And this is the algorithm in the middle. So I'll come back to that. This is the line in the sand, and I'm really sorry about the quality of the print. In fact, I'll tell you what, uh, 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 Scott, while I'm talking, can I pass them out? I'll, I'll pa just pass them in groups so that they can pass them forward. And you can look at it in the, in the hard copy, because you can't see that from the back, can you? I'll pass them out. Line in the sand. Intended action, intended consequence. Sabotage. That's quite straightforward, that one, isn't it? If I intend the action, soaring through a cable on your air helicopter, because I want it to become unserviceable, that's sabotage, isn't it? What do you want to do with me? You want to fire me? I want to send me to the, to, to the police, because that's, that, that's an illegal act, isn't it? So that's definitely over the line in the sand. Accountability here. So accountability is high that end and low this end. It's non-existent this end. There's no point in punishing me for making an error because it's an unintended act, unintentionally committed. There's no system safety benefit in punishing me. What you need to do is coach me and console me. That sounds a bit woolly, doesn't it? But it's an error. I didn't intend it to happen. So when you get the fair tool, if you can look at this page, it will help you. Rather than go through all the rest of it, please just go to this page. That's why I didn't <laughs> hand them out because I knew you'd all start reading them. <laughs> Please go to this page only. And follow the discussion, if you would. Page 11, thanks. So, I'm not going to go through this in great detail, because I don't need to, because it's relatively straightforward. You do an investigation, and you need to make a decision. But this is where the, dis the decision will take you to. It will take you from error to mistake, to types of violations, to sabotage. That's obvious. You want to punish for that. 
and you don't want to punish for this because it's unintended action and consequence. In the middle here, where you find most of your problem areas, there's a degree of punishment may be necessary to reduce the probability of reoccurrence. The thing about this is once it's published and it's in your procedures and you've inducted people into it and trained people in it and you've got trained investigators, it's repeatable. People begin to trust it and your reporting will start to increase massively because of it. I guarantee you. So, let's take my event where I left the oil cap off but the helicopter's been damaged, yes? Let's try it on the page before. You've done an investigation using trained investigators. So you answer these questions. I've gone up and I've opened the panel. I've realised it needs oil. I've taken the cap off and I've poured oil in. And you've, you, you've just distracted me, one of you two, distracted me. Um, was there a conscious and substantial and unjustifiable disregard for risk? Yes or no? Has I no? Pretty much all of you. So no. Were the rules intentionally broken, as far as you know? No. Was the correct plan of action selected? Mistake. Go to the next page. Mistake. It's an intended action, because I, had the, the, I, I intended to do it, but unintended consequences. So mistake, zero culpability, no point in blaming me because it won't change anything because I didn't intend to do it. But what you may do is coach, train, or take minor administrative action if it's happened to me before. And that might be a letter on my file or whatever. You might say, we're watching you, you that's twice that's happened. You know, that's got to check, but we're going to learn from it. And it's fair. We've done an investigation to find out what all the contributing factors are. And what was the primary contributing factor in this event? Distraction. Distraction. So what are you going to do about that? Remove it. So I can take you to an airline that when they're doing safety critical tasks, they wear yellow bibs and orange hats. And it says, do not disturb, do not disturb, rigging in process. And it's a distraction policy. And if you're someone's rigging a helicopter or a flying machine doing, doing flight control rigging, you do not distract them. They're not allowed to take their mobile phones into the hangar and the workplace, and you're not allowed to distract them. Because it was one of their top three human in the system risks. And that's what we're talking about here. So, we got to mistake, we may have got to error, depending on the investigation, but we'd have been even further down the left-hand side if we'd got to error. Sorry the wrong way. So, um, let's give you another example. It's a maintenance one, but it's nice and straightforward. Um, I've got to inspect rivets on, on, on this aircraft, this helicopter structure here. And it says I've got to use a bright light and I've got to be within arm's reach of the structure. But to get to here, I've got to have a special safety razor, a hydraulic safety razor to get to here. I get the hydraulic safety razor and I get to here and I do the inspection and I miss a crack. What's that? It's an error. I did all the right thing, I got the procedure, I followed it correctly, and I missed the crack. Uh, and we said, how reliable is a human as part of the system? 100%? Less. That's what we're talking about, one in a thousand. There's my error, made it, done it. We know that when we design the aircraft. Anyway, another, another story for another day. Now, I'm over here, and I go to get the work stand and it doesn't work. And I've been reporting that it doesn't work to you managers for ages and you've not done anything about it. I know the helicopter's got to go, so I stand over here and I go, yeah, I've missed the crack. Let's go for that one then. I've got to get the work stand and it doesn't work. I've reported it before to you and you haven't done anything about it. I miss a crack. Sorry? Routine. Let's test it. Was there conscious and sub substantial and unjustifiable disregard for risk? Hands up if you think no. Hands up if you think no first. Four, five, six. Read, read what it says. It says and.
Was there substantial and conscious and unjustifiable disregard? Did I try and do it? So, hands up if you think it's no. That's better. Hands up if you think it's yes. This is the problem with just culture. Now you're proving what the problem is. What do you need to know more of? You need an investigation, don't you, to find out about the work stands and my choices. So straight away, we've got into the place you'll find yourself. You need the ability to call on an investigation to make a fair judgment. Do you agree? Then we can move on. Because I haven't got time to go through every scenario I'd love to with you. But you can come to the UK and we'll help you if you want to do that. But this you can follow. Go back and run back one of your previous investigations through this and see where it gets you. Just follow it. It's self-evident. It takes you into these boxes here, and on those boxes you can decide what to do. And this one here says manage through taking appropriate disciplinary action. This one here is about changing the system. This one here is just saying that that happens but we want to know when it does, so keep telling us. <coughs> so, that's a quick run through the system. I'll come back to it at the end, we've got time, but I just want to finish this part and then we'll come back to the tool and work through some others. Does it deliver and does it work across national cultures? Well, it definitely works in an Anglo-Saxon culture. It even works in Holland. We <laughs> 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 were not Anglo-Saxon, I've learned. <laughs> he said with an orange tie on. Um, <laughs> um, does it work in the Asia Pacific? It depends on. in all Anglo-Saxon organisations automatically. I didn't say that, okay? That is not the case. Some of them remain very blamey and they don't know what's going on and what people are having to do. I didn't say that. What I'm saying is I can prove it can work in an Anglo-Saxon culture if they do all the right things. But I've seen this used in Asia Pacific successfully um, and, and it can work even if the national culture is different. I can see, I've seen it work in a military environment, and, and the U UK military have this very well embedded. They have the DA Fair, the, the Defence Aviation Fair tool that's hugely, hugely commonly used. But where in, in the British Army, where they're very blamey, they like a bit of punishment in the British Army, I can tell you. <laughs> Um, they have a helicopter operation right in the middle of it and it has a big wire fence around it. And it says, when you come in here, we have a just culture. I don't care what the rest of the army does, but in here we have a just culture because we're all about aviation safety. So you have to put a fence around it, metaphorically. But you can do it, okay? It is doable. You have to have a common toolkit. It has to be repeatedly used. It has to be sold to the workforce and they have to be inducted into it. That's the important facts. Um, these are the sorts of statements that we're getting back from users of, of this type of approach. Don't, there are other tools out there. Go use them. I'm only giving you that one because I want you to use it. I don't want you to buy it. It's free. Look. It, just do it because it works. This is the station commander at Royal Air Force Lossy Mountain where they grounded two squadrons of tornadoes. So 24 aircraft were grounded because a young corporal put his hand up and said, uh, this is what we're doing to get the job done. We're now undertaking an activity that normally only would have resulted from an accident. In this case, no one was hurt, nothing was damaged. The last three weeks have seen some of the most valuable people-centered safety management activities we've conducted. They were shocked at what they found. And what was interesting was, when they came to the application of just culture, it was the management that were over the line in the sand, increasing risk inappropriately and unjustifiably. The 
management at a line, a line level, line management level. People underneath weren't happy, people above didn't know it was happening. All violations are known by or condoned by some level of management. That's a rule of this stuff. Someone knows. One of our clients, not that one, not that one. Yes, that one. I'm glad I didn't put his name up there. Great. Um, they found out, this guy found out they had a thing called Black Ops in their airline after they launched their Just Culture campaign. And they trained everybody in it. People put their hands up in one of these classrooms and told some of my guys, we've got a thing called Black Ops in this airline. What do you think Black Ops is about? <laughs> it's all the secret stuff underneath the iceberg down here. How we get jets there one every day when they can't do it in the course of the book. And they had all sorts of Black Ops quick fixes. So they actually didn't, they hadn't gone quite as far as having an app, but they were planning on having a Black Ops app for the engineers. <laughs> what they did have was a secret website that you could link into, and on there it would give you stand numbers, and you know, stands at airports, because they're hard things to find. It's a little map of all the stands, all useful information. It's like an unofficial, commonly shared black book. Um, and in there, it had quick fixes. When this light comes on, do these three things, and the light will go out. Wow. Um, so Black Ops was all about making the system work. And they found out, and he said, I'm stunned a bit by what's been culturally accept acceptable. He phoned me and he said, Kevin, can we have lunch? I know what that means now. <laughs> <laughs> He's scared to death and he wants free consulting. And he thinks buying me lunch is gonna do it. And it did, it was really interesting. He said, what would you do? And I said, I'd just, just, just be calm for a moment because it's been going on for years. And he said, I said, when did you find out? He said, this morning. I said, what time? He said, 8 o'clock. And I counted and I said, right, that's, that's 16 hours since we learned yesterday in the classroom. And I said, what do you think of that? And he said, I don't know what you mean. I said, is that a good or a bad thing that they've told you? What do you think? It's a great thing. Because they're going, me and us. It's a third aid report telling him. Now, I didn't want my guys who were running the, the workshop to come and tell him. Because that's not a just culture. Is it? So they'd opened up the culture. Now he had a management problem he didn't know he had before. So instead of taking, an example was, instead of taking the aircraft down to an engine ground runway at Heathrow and tying it down on the ground and paying for the use of that engine ground runway and doing an overnight high power engine run to do EPR um, uh, margin uh, compressor washes, they found a quicker way of doing it outside the hangar at night, just doing a dry cycle on the engine. And they've been doing it for years. And the EPR margins are exactly where they wanted them to be. It was so impressive that Airbus have been studying whether they can use that as an alternative process. But it was all hidden because they didn't have an open culture. Uh, final one then, I'm shocked and depressed. But at least I know where I am now and I'm plotting the course to point B and it's become easier. This is an aircraft manufacturer that you'd all know very well. This is what happens when you lift the lid off. So when you say you've got a just culture, this is the stuff you'll be finding out about. It does deliver. Um, this is the REF in the UK, the Royal Air Force. They measure numbers of reports. They measure first, second, and third aid reports. Third aid is the me and us stuff. And over, over 2014, they had 92 third aid reports. And when we talked to the people who put those third aid reports, this is what we're having to do to get the job done, they said, they said, what was the primary reason you were willing to report? They said, trust that something was going to happen and it wasn't going to count against me. Even if someone's over the line and they've put one of these reports in, sometimes you might not punish them. Does that make sense? because you send a big message to everybody else in the early days of a just culture that, that you, it's worth reporting. You'd say to them, you're really close, and if we didn't want system improvement, you'd, you'd be gone. You might say that to them, but you're making a judgment on, protect, on protection here, protection of your culture. So, I said I'd show you some horror story examples. They're maintenance ones, but it's really hard to photograph flight operations ones. These are fire bottles from a large four-engine aeroplane. 
And that's what it should look like, and that's what it did look like, because the labels had been transposed for years. So the wrong orientation of these would have meant that when the fire handle was pulled and you fire the fire bottle into number one engine, it would have gone into number two engine. So you put the fire out on the engine that's working. You put the engine fire out. Yet for years, local, the guys in the hangar, they knew they were having to transpose these and reallocate them, move them, until somebody who didn't know this, as a new person who didn't know what the norm was, put them in the wrong way and they were cross-connected. But for years, nobody said anything until they had a just culture. Even the one that had been cross-connected was kept secret. But everybody in the hangar knew about it, except who? The newbie and the toppy. Another one there, that's a fuel content plug. Thin fuel content. They couldn't get the plug undone, so they cut it off. Guess what? Guess what they didn't have? Another one. Go on. Another plug. Another <laughs> plug. So, that's what a replacement plug looks like. That's how they made it work. They put a locking wire around it. It's, it's thin fuel content. Is that important? It's not only important about how much fuel you've got, it's really important about the C of G of the aeroplane in this case, keeping the thing flying straight and level. So it, it just went, ah, this might be a third day report. Let me tell you about what we had to do. And it's still on the aeroplane, we can go and show you. So the guy took the camera out and look at this is what we call a third day report. Does that make sense? This is what your people are doing to get the job done. This is the prize for having a just culture. They'll tell you this stuff. Uh, one of my guys flies for a UK airline at, at, at part time, uh, and he's in the right hand seat of a large commercial transport aircraft. The V1, the DV window came open. The big direct vision window came open, big enough for a human to get out of in an emergency. And um, at the top of climb, after a lot of calamity and dust flying around the, the flight deck, and him wrestling to get the window closed and all of that good stuff, the captain said to him, Welcome to the club. What does that mean? It happens, yeah. Who doesn't know about it? The new guy and the top guy. <laughs> so, what type of culture is that? This is an airline with a very mature safety risk management system. What's that telling you about the safety culture? They don't have one. It's unjust. So he reported it, and all the other people it had happened to were really unhappy with him now because he's not in their club. And they were worried that they'd be found out. But they said, well, there's no point in reporting it, Carl. You're wasting your time. Nothing will happen. And sure enough, nothing did happen. Nothing changed. Apart from pilots were told to be careful when closing that DV window because the pop-out pin doesn't quite come up sometimes. And you have to wait all that handle. So is that a lasting defense? Is that going to bite a new person in the future who hasn't waggled the handle or hasn't been taught? Of course, it's just sitting there waiting to go off again. <coughs> so, you'll get lots of reporting. It'll be all good stuff. What I really wanted to show you is this stuff here. You can see these when I send you the slides. This is the human in the system picture. So this says installation error in this particular organization, this airline, is the biggest problem they've got. Human in the system risk, installation error. They can only get this because people are telling them what they nearly do wrong as much as what actually goes wrong. When you drill into installation error, the biggest problem is information. The second biggest problem is factors affecting the human. The third one is aircraft design, configuration and parts. So now you know what your top three human in the system risks are, you can start to manage them. How many of you have got this stuff across your organisation? This is what a just culture will deliver to you. So when you drill into information, not used is the biggest problem. So what they did was they gave everybody an orange A5 clipboard. And they said, when you're doing maintenance on aircraft, you will use that A5, that A5 clipboard and it will have the latest information on it at all times. So what does that... Is that good? Is that bad? What do you think of that as an intervention? Yeah. 
still involves a lot of human action, doesn't it? What I'm interested in is why they're not using the information. Not just that they're not. Typically, they didn't know the why question. But it's not a bad intervention, because at least you can see if people have got A5 orange clipboards, and you can stand in anger and see them. You can point and shout, you haven't got a clipboard, go and get one. <laughs> yeah, it might shift the risk, absolutely. Um, but, but what I'm interested in is why. Most reasons for non-use is availability, intelligibility, and correctness. They're the things to start to drain that swamp. But at least we know it's a problem. Incorrect, unavailable, not understandable. But in this case, it was just they weren't using it because it was routine work and they didn't think they needed to. That may not be a bad thing. Factors affecting performance. Time constraint, number one. Easy to install incorrectly. Work process procedure not followed. Amount of supervision. Technical knowledge and skills, inadequate. Look how much bigger that is than the others in there in terms of technical knowledge under installation. Communication issue between engineering staff, between shifts, between departments. High noise levels, lighting cold. We can do something about that. Equipment. Repetitive, monotonous tasks are error provocative. There's a surprise. Um, information. So we've got a summary there of the human in the system risks. And it's coming from hazard data, not current data. You won't get any of this if people don't trust you to tell you the truth. So, before I go back up there, the fair tool you have in front of you is just a handrail. It isn't absolute. You still have management decisions to make, okay? But it's repeatable. It's publishable. You can download it off my website and put it straight into your procedures with a bit of your world tweaking around it. And it will work. Providing providing it's put into a structured process and it has leadership buy-in. What does that mean? What on earth does that mean? Which management? All management. They've got to understand it. They've got to be taught it. They won't be able to read that and just go, yes, we're going to do that. We go to organisations where the top man has said, yes, we commit to a just culture in this business. And I said, well, what does that mean? He says, well, we, we, you know, we, uh, well, we don't want to, um, uh, yeah, what does that mean? They don't know. They haven't been educated in it. They need to be educated. And then you need competence for the people using it. Competence you can get, you can read that, you can practice it, you can do it. But it's vital that you know that you, you have a common process and everyone is held to account for applying that <coughs> common process. So, if we said at the beginning your practice safety culture is founded upon this, I think I've just proven to you that some of what you find out is very scary. I've got lots and lots of examples there which I can't show you because it's too obvious who it is and where it is and I haven't got their permission to do so. But it all comes from having an open, fair and just culture which is repeatable and it's transparent, and everybody understands it. We've talked about that, and we've talked about that. But it must be commonly applied across businesses. And it doesn't matter how international you are, you want it as common as possible, and as different as necessary. And what does that mean? Is don't change the framework, change some of the language, as long as semantic meaning is the same. Just fiddle with the language locally. I can promise you it works. It's worked in Africa, it's worked in the Asia Pacific, it's worked in the Americas. When I say it's worked, it's working in all of those places, working in Europe. But it is difficult in some parts of the Middle East. It is difficult because of the national culture and how that works. But it is working as long as you put a metaphorical barbed wire around it and I can take you to an aviation organisation in Saudi Arabia where they have made, made a just culture process work very effectively. They haven't got the reporting culture that they want just yet, but it's beginning to build. You're asking people to leave their national culture outside the door and come into a different culture. That's the challenge you face. But you can do it, and I'm happy to discuss that with you further. Now that's a very quick gallop through. I'm happy to go back over any point that you want me to. Yes, sir. Um, I was just a lesson I wanted to share with our organization tonight. Uh, the, the person who happens to have my heart has the risk uh, for his uh, grandkids to tell the story. Uh, we had an employee fall off the top of the wing in an aircraft in Port Said, yeah. in Panama Hospital. And um, within an hour or so after the ambulance left, an administrator's assistant. Uh, came up to me and said, 
is focused, I would add to the yours in brackets, around aviation safety. You don't want to use a fair tool or anything like it, you just culture toolkit. You don't want to use it for people who come late to work routinely and for people who have got a drug problem, etc. That's there. There's a system and a process for that. Um, and for someone who, who who's just plain criminal, there's a system for that. And it's called 911 or whatever in your country, 999 in my country. Um, this is for aviation safety. Anyone who, who's, whose actions impact or could impact aviation safety, that's where this works. So if I go back up to this slide here, I'm sorry to do this in front of you, but I can't switch the projector off. Um, if I go back to the arrangement slide here, where we went right into the, this stuff here, it, it is about aviation safety, okay? It's about this stuff here. And it's about getting, getting away from the place we've been in the past. And it does include everybody proactively. Because if that person had proactively said, I'm not happy with what you're doing, I can't stand by while you do that. Did you get off the wing? Please. Because I don't want to watch you hurt yourself. That means that we're living. We're being, we're living it. We're, we're doing it. And making it happen. That's being fair. That's being just. That's being, it, it's just safety behaviour stuff. Yes, sir. Sorry, Kevin. Just to uh, amplify what the gentleman was saying as well, um, I, um, a couple of years ago, uh, did a chainsaw course, chainsaw operated course. Yeah. And part of the course included uh, health and safety. Yeah. Uh, where the instructor was talking about that very thing, where uh, he gave us some case examples in, in UK law where the supervisor has actually been, you know, found guilty of somebody else's injury yeah. because he saw it but just didn't do anything about it. Yeah. You know, and you know, I think in one case the guy broke his back, in the other there was a fatality. Yeah. Um, and, and he was called, this uh, instructor of ours, was actually called as an expert witness, um, you know, because he had actually, I think he, he'd been involved in some way with a guy who had seen that the, the, the other fella was doing an unsafe act, yeah. uh, but just didn't do anything about it. Didn't okay. tell him nothing and, well, I've seen, we, we've seen this most successfully applied. I'm not just talking about fair here. We're giving you that as, as, because I don't want to give you problems. I want to give you a solution. Uh, we want everyone to use it for, for, for aviation safety reasons. I don't want to sell this. It would feel immoral to sell this. I want people to use it because I know it works. Um, uh, we've seen this mostly, most successfully applied in the place I thought it would be least successfully applied, and that's UK military aviation. They were quite blameworthy. They liked a bit of blame. They liked a bit of military law. You know, and I speak as an ex-military person. Um, they're using it really effectively. And in fact, they, they went to a place where they became non-blame because they knew that if they blamed and punished people, it ended their careers and they didn't want that to happen. This has made them much more rigid around, the, around this process. And they've got a massive amount of safety information now that they didn't have before. And it's just like lifting a lid once you lift that lid, you'll find all sorts of things that are of great value to safety performance in your business. And I believe, I honestly believe, this is one of the key fundamental cornerstones of safety risk management. And it's where people understand the difference between acceptable and unacceptable behaviors. And it's the difference between that and that. Any other questions? Anything? Yes, sir. Now that's massive for the Royal Air Force. That would have never have happened 
five, three years ago, let alone ten, no way that would have happened. If you go on the perfect storm, they published it in what they call air cruise, which is their aviation safety magazine. And they constantly are publishing stories of the new world that they find themselves in. Now that's quite old fashioned, the magazine. But a safety magazine is a really good thing to have in the business. You can have it in the in the in the rest facilities, in the bathroom, in the toilet, in the loo, as we say in England, um, and people will read it. And that's one way. Um, other organisations have screensavers, which is safety screensavers, and anyone can raise one, and that, where they catch themselves in their new world. And that gets pu published through their marketing department, internal marketing and communication department, and it's put up on every screen in the business. So it be a maintenance screen, or, or stores, or manager's screens, and it's coming at you that reporting is worthwhile. Look what's happening from it. Not statistics, real examples. Uh, and at a basic level, it's direct feedback, digitally, automatically, we've got your report, keep them coming, thank you very much. And then at a specific level, certainly in the early days, as you transition from second to third age reporting, from them to me and us, you've got to thank people personally. You've got to catch them. And the person to catch them is, executive management and give them an award, shake their hand, thank you for that, that's valuable stuff. Promote them, give them something good, time off or money, <laughs> I don't know, but I, I, I advocate that strongly. Um, that's what we're talking about and we always put it at the bottom here, feedback and promotion to develop a learning and a safety culture. It's, it's, you know, getting budget for this stuff is tough. If the top people don't know where you're going and what you're going to get when you get there, you'll never get the budget for it. I've seen a, a, an, an aviation organisation that had a, um, a safety magazine, um, and it was really high quality. It was glossy paper. It was stuff that in that airline only ever was for pilots in the past. This was for everybody, ground ops, uh, 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 maintenance, uh, worthiness management, included everyone in the safety story. And w as soon as the business had a small downturn blip or the fuel price went up, they cancelled the magazine, never brought it back. But when you go home, this is the answer I always give, you, and look up at the, the digital kit in front of you all now. That's how we communicate today. So communicate through that. Have an online magazine. Have, have regular communication that reporting is worthwhile. Look what it does. It changes things. It makes benefit. It's a long answer. I, 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 I'm, where I see it working, there's a, there's a safety promotion branch in big companies. There's a group of people who do safety promotion for a living, and you find yourself a really good comms person, you teach them about safety. You get them to do it. In a small business, you've got to do it. And it might be going out to someone and saying, you know that report you sent in the other day? Look what's happened. Fantastic. And, and try and do it in front of other people. I know this sounds obvious, but do you do it? Do we do this? I'm not sure we do. To answer your question, clever comms is the answer. Digital clever comms. I can take it from an airline, it's got a, 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 an app, a safety app. And every time it updates, it pings you an email, a message, or a text, depending on how you choose, to say there's something new on there. And people use it, read it, feedback. Four minutes, anything left? Yes, sir. Yeah, the best composition is, is, is a safety management person. It doesn't have to be a manager, but someone who understands and, and is expert in safety management. It's like making a financial management decision without a financial expert in there. You wouldn't do it, would you? 
You know, you're someone who understands financial risk management, so an SMS person, and any number of trained, trained ERG members. Now, what they're training is understanding human factors, difference between errors and violations, types of errors and violations, understanding the investigation process, understanding all of this. So, if you go on our website, you'll see a, an outline syllabus for, for that training. Um, subject matter experts, who you can ask questions of, when you've got the why questions in the investigation, you can do some of the tests that result in, in there, substitution tests, routine tests, etc. Um, is the best thing. If, if you have one of them, one of them, and one of them, you've still got three people to find, haven't you? Yet if you know you want a just culture, you've got to invest in that. Now when the UK military, we started the programme with them, you know, uh, they said there's no way we're going to be able to find those people. We haven't got enough people to fly and maintain the jets as it is. Now, three years later, they've got 1,000, nearly 700 investigators. They've got about 800 trained ERG people, and they make it happen. Not as often as they'd like, but they do make it happen because of how to account to make it happen. And why not this person? Because they're, they're, they're partial. They'll have a view on the person and the problem. And they might well be part of the problem. So make it a routine up front that we don't normally invite in the manager of the area, but we take the outcome of the ERG to them. And we talk to them about the outcome of the ERG, the event review. Um, they should not be part of the ERG decision making. And that's, that's something to say hard and fast up front in your procedure and be softer on later. Does that make sense? If you go soft, it's hard to go hard later on. You don't want them to be involved because they are, they will have, they will have biases about the person, about the job, and they'll say, oh, you know, that, that job's easy to do. There's no way that this guy's over the line. He does that all the time. We don't want him in there having those discussions. That's an investigation thing that we do. And then we, we, we take previous into account here. And we may have to talk to the line manager then. Okay, that's the time to bring them in so they're, they're part of the process. Um, I've been given the final warning. <coughs> I'm happy to stay as long as possible. <laughs> I hope it's been of use. It's a real gallop through. We've done a, what, what is a one day program here in an hour and a half, so I'm sorry I've skipped over it, but I, I hope it's been useful for you. Download the fair tool off our website. I'll know if you have, because I get an email saying you have. But I'm really interested in you know, where you go with it. Does it work? I mean, it's come out as fair too recently because we've had feedback from a lot of our users on some of the things that weren't working so well. So, good luck.